Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Isabella Tabarovsky, and I'm a senior program associate at the Wilson Center's Canon Institute. Thank you for joining us today for our conversation, understanding the problem of domestic violence in Russia. Today's discussion is the first in our new series of events and programming focusing on the status of women in Russia and Eurasia. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you to stay up to date with upcoming events and publications on our website, as well as our podcast, Canon X, and our newest podcast, The Russia File. You can find our latest analysis of events in the region on our Russia File and Focus Ukraine blogs. Throughout the program, if you have questions for our guests, you can submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. So without further ado, let's begin with our first panelist, uh, Dr. Mariana Moraviova is Professor of Russian Law and Administration at the University of Helsinki, who specializes in women's rights and violence against women. She uses intersectional theory and sociolegal analysis to explore various types and strategies women use to combat gender inequality and violence. Her latest publications and media appearances focus on barriers in achieving gender equality for younger women, including sexual harassment. And I'm very pleased to say that she will be joining the Cannon Institute as a George F. Cannon Fellow next year. Dr. Moraviova, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks very much, Isabel. And um, good uh, morning, everyone who, who is in the United States. And um, I'm here in, um, in Europe um, to be more precise in Petersburg. Uh, and um, it's evening here. So I'm happy to um, uh, present um, my view on um, what's happening with the situation of, of domestic violence in uh, the Russian Federation. I'm going to share my PowerPoint uh, now so that um, everyone could see the slides and uh, relate uh, to the um, slides. So how are we gonna, so we're gonna do this. Yes, um, uh, can you see the slides? Right. So um, what is gender-based violence in the uh, Russian context? And we have two um, approaches to that. And I'm going to focus on a legal approach as well as um, on, um, um, on a little bit of histories of, um, domestic, of the uh, legal approaches to domestic violence. Uh, while colleague of mine, um, uh, Professor Johnson, is going to be focusing on political science approach and empirical analysis of campaigns. And then Alona uh, Papova will introduce the latest activist attempt to promote legislation on domestic violence. So mine is a sort of a, a legal background so you could um, understand what's happening in, in this particular sphere. So um, if you look at the Russian law currently, there's no official definition of uh, domestic violence, any family crimes or anything related to, um, uh, to this uh, particular sphere. If um, you as lawyers would tell you, so if you come to ask to seek help and ask for help, these are the articles of the criminal code that you use to, um, uh, um, um, to prosecute for, um, uh, for what we call domestic violence in, in academic literature as well as uh, in other legislations. So I have a list of articles uh, that uh, the criminal code, uh, the charges could be brought upon you and see um, that it's uh, rape, other violent acts of sexual nature, cursing to conduct acts of sexual violence, then a variety of articles on assault, there is a premedia, uh, there's, there's, there's different degrees of, uh, of harm inflicted, um, and uh, whether it's uh, premeditated or not, or intentional or not. There is a very interesting article, 117, torment in Russian as this designer, but I don't translate that the torture because there is an article on torture, it's a different uh, type of, um, of um, uh, corpus delicti. There is kidnapping and there is um, trafficking, so all these articles of the criminal code could be used by a survivor of domestic violence to bring charges uh, against um, um, spouses or partners or uh, whoever they uh, have it with. So these are general articles. Uh, it means that anyone could bring charges under these articles against uh, either a stranger or uh, a person who is close uh, to them. Um, if you look at the literature, uh, so you have uh, an interesting uh, discrepancy here. There is a Soviet definition of uh, domestic violence that we inherited. It's called family domestic violence or 
everyday violence, because I mean, the, the, the word with семейные бытовые преступления is very difficult to translate into English because it's a very specific um, type of, of category that emerged in, in, in a Soviet uh, times. And then if you look at the contemporary legal literature as well as, as um, other literature, you have a lot of definitions. You have domestic violence, you have family violence, violence in the family, you have spousal violence, you have sexual harassment, and all these words and all these categories are used in um, uh, those um, in, in in the academic works that um, are not applicable to actual to actual law to the criminal court statutes, but they used by uh, by the academics as well as uh, as people who actually practice uh, law. Therefore, we have that uh, this balance in, in academic literature as well as just um, a sort of uh, literature on that and, and, and the law. And of course, uh, this particular discrepancy uh, calls to be bridged. And um, if you look at um, the histories of legislation, um, it, it gives you some insight to what's actually happening and why this is happening. So if you think about today, and I'm just gonna um, uh, do the today situation that um, uh, sums up again, the legal uh, work. So what we have today is that Russia has not signed Istanbul Convention and has no intention to do so. So if you look at the criminal and administrative codes and with the previous slide where I listed the, the articles that the charges could be brought upon. So that's the instrumental approach to um, any type of sort of family crime. So there's an instrument you use to prosecute. There is a universalist approach to punishment. That means that there is no specific punishment was uh, um, uh, lighter or heavier for those who committed domestic it's just exactly the same if um, the same acts are committed against the stranger or against a close person. You have what is called public-private prosecution for rape, and you have private prosecution, Article 116, and there's been a big um, um, debate around Article 116, which is a simple battery or simple assault without um, uh, consequences for health, but all the rest uh, articles of the sort of public prosecution, and if you know anything about private public prosecution, it's mostly who bears the burden of proof. So in the private prosecution is the um, plaintiff, and in public prosecution is the state has to prosecute no matter what. So there's no concept of domestic violence in law, but that has not been so historically. Actually, Russia is one of the first or the first state to prosecute for domestic violence and, had, and having had the category of domestic violence in its law. Um, at least since the 17th century, and that's one of the documents in the 18th century, a term disposes life, including domestic violence, was an official ground for divorce. And there's a lot of divorces uh, around uh, um, charges of domestic violence. So the whole 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, you see the grounds for domestic violence as being the reason for divorce. Um, and the second one would be adultery. And so if you actually compare the numbers of divorces for adultery and for domestic, and those, those two could go together very often. But if you actually look at the numbers, they're almost 50-50. Now, uh, Russia was the first, Russian Empire was the first European state to uh, criminalize domestic violence officially in law. That was the Penal Code of 1845 and Article 2075. Punishment for injuring a spouse um, was two degrees higher than punishment for just injuries against the stranger. So the state recognized that um, uh, domestic abusers should be punished much severely because they inflicted uh, um, uh, injuries uh, or violence on those who are close and um, they're supposed to do so. Now, this particular, um, um, and so the, the, this special category of domestic violence was in Russian law before 1917, when the Soviet lawyers, in fact, removed it, and they removed it with the purpose of emancipating women. So in fact, when they were doing this reform and removing the whole complex of crimes within the family as a special category, they were doing that in the name of the progress and emancipation of women. So the logic behind this was that the woman should be emancipated from the family. That also means from any category related to the family. And if you want to do that, so in law, she should not be connected to any uh, mention of a family. And therefore, domestic violence as a category was viewed as an old category that also oppressed women and put them in the victimhood position. Therefore, in a criminal code of 1926, all these crimes, the achievements of the 1845 codes were removed. And it's quite interesting because it was, of course, 
was a very radical idea at the time. It backfired, it backfired already by 1930s. But of course, the Russian population, especially male population, started thinking that removing these crimes meant that there was a license to actually, so it gave them the license to actually commit domestic violence. And by 1930s, um, uh, by that time, Stalin was in power. Stalin's government understood that that was a mistake because the numbers of domestic violence has risen and um, there were uh, several um, ordinances issued by the government uh, to prosecute for domestic violence. And uh, the majority of the ordinances firmly placed the category of domestic violence under the hooliganism charges. So in fact, through, through the Soviet times, domestic violence was a part of hooliganism. And hooliganism is a very complicated category. So it's both public and private hooliganism could have been committed in communal apartments as well as in public sphere. And also, uh, thanks to the Soviet times, uh, we have the concept of public danger as main grounds for criminalization of an action. Domestic violence was not viewed as public danger because it's a private matter. And so uh, today, today's discourse and the reluctance of contemporary legal system also to accommodate that is firmly based on the understanding that domestic violence is actually not public danger. So it's not a danger to society per se, it's danger to uh, specific individuals but that does not mean the consequences of these um, actions could be viewed as, as dangerous to public. And that um, should be um, understood when uh, you know, one tries to understand why Duma, as well as, as, as um, um, lawyers, judges, and so a huge uh, amount of people who actually resist uh, to the introduction of a specific legislation um, uh, argue that they don't need a specific legislation, that criminal code is good enough, you know, that's that we have all this article, so why do we need uh, domestic violence as a very, as a, as a specific category? So we do need actually domestic violence as a specific category. And there is a reference to the book we've done. So um, that's just the numbers. And uh, you could see uh, that um, uh, in, in, in the lowest table that uh, women are the main um, uh, survivors of domestic violence and up to, um, I'm sorry, that's the, the last update was 2018 due to probably coronavirus or whatever. So the um, uh, what's good at least that uh, Russian um, uh, Statistical Bureau at least now is collecting these statistics since 2012 before we didn't have any statistics. So you can find it at this web page. So uh, there's a link to, to the official statistics of the uh, Russian Federal Agency, Statistical Agency. So there was a 2016-17 debate, I'm pretty sure Alona as well as, as um, 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 Janet are going to talk about it. That was uh, the debate uh, about decriminalization of domestic violence, which as that's not what happened, but that was uh, what happened to very temporary um, introduction of the notion of violence uh, on behalf of the close or towards the close person. And since 1917 or since 1926, that was the first ever recognition of uh, uh, domestic violence in the criminal code, but it was very quickly removed. And you can see, um, I've just put the picture of, of how the editing is going in law. So you have two articles and, and the second one is what was removed and how that was edited. And that's your legislation, legislative process. So how they de decide what to remove or what to, you know, what to strike out or what to add. So sometimes it's very good to know, again, so what, what's, what's the fight you know, for um, uh, for uh, you know, sort of for, for for the main categories, and um, so to remind you, in in Article 116, there was assault as a private prosecution, and the original version was just assault not resulting in physical pain. And what um, Marie Daftan and um, and her group managed to do with the support of the state Duma's deputies, they managed to introduce uh, the uh, category of closed person, Article 116, so that, um, uh, that, that, that stated criminal offence. But unfortunately, it was very short-lived. So that was July 2016, it was introduced. And then in February 2017, thanks to Vizulina and her supporters, uh, that was sort of removed back. And that article uh, uh, sort of, it did not actually you know, go back to its original uh, wording. It was something else, but uh, domestic violence disappeared uh, again. So um, after that, and Alona is going to be talking in detail about the campaign. So after that, there's a huge awareness and there's been a huge fight for, um, uh, for the law on prevention of domestic violence. And I do apologize for the typo on prevention of domestic violence. And um, so the Council of Europe worked together with the Russian um, government to produce a draft law and they did it. But the problem is that, uh, and you can see again on a slide, 
find that what happened with the original draft when it ended up in a federation council, that the federation council actually completely rewrote it, trying to meet the needs of the public, right? So that was, so they, 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 uh, they've taken into account the parental movement's opinions, conservative group's opinion, blah, blah, blah. And um, that particular draft that Federation Council offered for the public debate um, was a bizarre draft from the point of view of law, of course, you know, I'm not gonna even talk about like feminist thought, et cetera, et cetera. So even legally, the definitions they've offered could not be in a, in a normal law because they they're not that's not that they are illegal they are illegal but they are not proper definitions that anybody from the point of view of even the technique of legislation would actually allow into that and whatever you think about Russian law and legislation they're still pretty well trained and I'm one of the professors who actually trained that so I know that it's not going to be that but anyway uh, just to sum up. We can see that while the original draft there was a proper definition of domestic violence that we use in um, in international legislation, um, again in, in 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 academic literature as well, which got changed into uh, the uh, definition um, saying that domestic violence is violence that is not criminal, which is absurd because any violence, of course, should be criminalized. You know, in a sense, so um, they changed um, certain um, uh, uh, focuses on the protection of a family. They, um, instead of actually looking at the protection of human rights, you know, the first came, let's think about the strength of the protection of the family. Um, but the good thing is that the restraining order still orders, that was the novelty of the legislation still stayed in that draft. And uh, the system of state funded shelters still stayed in the draft, you know, no matter how they try to change that. And although they try to, to, sh try to shift um, uh, uh, focus on reconciliation as a preventive measure, which again is very problematic in domestic violence, but um, no, that didn't change the sort of contents of the second part of the draft. Now that draft was tabled due to the coronavirus, although Matvey Yanka still says that, you know, they're sort of thinking about it. However, parallel, and then Deleona is gonna talk um, more about it, uh, there was a response to that draft developed by activists and uh, another sort of uh, suggestions to change the official draft that again, this is a different from the first draft. Um, and I'm not gonna go into these details because then Alona is gonna be better on that than I, uh, than I am. So to sum up, so what needs to be done? The law on prevention of domestic violence needs to be amended according to the international law and the constitution of the Russian Federation. That's, uh, um, that's what Alona and, and Asana Pushkin are doing, you know, in a sense that uh, they're trying to bring that uh, in accordance to what um, they're actually committed to do as well. And the criminal code shall include a separate article or complex of articles um, on prosecution violence in the family. And that could be either Spanish or French models and they could use the Russian legal heritage. That's the point. It's not that Russia has never had anything on domestic violence. We have, and if you think about traditional values, and uh, that could be a good argument for, uh, for uh, activists as well. This is very traditional. We're actually going back to the roots and here is your roots and the imperial legislation of the mid 19th century, even before that, that's very traditional. If Russian Orthodox Church recognized domestic violence as a reason for divorce, that should be good enough for traditional values discourse. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. This was a fascinating presentation. So now uh, we'll go to Dr. Janet Elise Johnson, who will talk to, uh, to us about the specifics of the legislation uh, that's currently uh, being reviewed and how it's evolved over time. Dr. Johnson is a professor of political science at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. Her books include The Gender of Informal Politics, Gender Violence in Russia, and Living Gender Under Communism. She has published widely and has held numerous prestigious fellowships. Uh, and I would like to remind you that if you have questions for our guests, you can submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page. And please, again, include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. Uh, Dr. Johnson, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and, and thanks to the Kennedy Institute and the Wilson Center, and I'm honored to be pre presenting with Mariana and Aliona. Let me share my slides. 
All right. So I'm gonna be talking about the authoritarian politics of domestic violence reform and backlash in Russia. And to start talking about the problem of domestic violence, I wanna start with the point that defining the problem and getting it on the agenda has been the key political struggle for three decades. And so feminists have noticed that, that, that issues related to gender are different because defining the problem is the crucial problem. And um, activists, can be seen as an epistemic community, a community that's producing knowledge that's in abeyance in the sense that the state has been restricting it. And this creates problems when you have an issue like domestic violence, which needs to be defined in terms of the data. So as Mariana points out, there, the state is now collecting data, but even so, the way that the data is collected um, the way that the state responds to domestic violence and the perception of domestic violence shapes the data. We don't always know, we, we really don't have great information about the extent of the problem over time. And people, when the state responds to domestic violence, there tends to be an increase in domestic violence that's reported because then they see that it's seen as a problem. And I just wanna point out, and, and I don't mean this to be pointed, but the, there's often this statistic that 14,000 women die every year from domestic violence in Russia. And that is a problematic statistic that cannot be, the, the, at, at most in the 1990s, the total homicide rate was 14,000. And so I just kind of urge all of us who are committed to domestic violence reform not use that data anymore because it's just problematic. My approach today will be to focus on the authoritarian dynamics and I'm gonna be doing a comparative analysis of the three recent policymaking processes to help us understand the current one. And I just wanna note that almost every, I think every post communist country has adopted some kind of domestic violence law and Russia really is the outlier. In doing this, I do wanna make sure that I'm centering the Women's Crisis Center movement in Russia. And that is important to think about the feminist activist, even as I, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the state. And the activists have been trying valiantly for decades to try to get a domestic violence law. And it's not just a normative commitment on my part, it's an empirical one in the sense that when we do comparative analysis of progressive policy reform, the most essential thing is feminist activism. The only way to get domestic violence reform is to have a strong feminist activist um, uh, pressing for it. At the same time, Russia is a little bit different than other countries that we tend to think of, or at least you know, in the West, there's sort of a model we think about uh, democratic policy reform. And I wanna make the argument that we, we need to be thinking about the specifics of authoritarian policy making. And what this means that in Russia, the state has greatly limited the role of feminists and activists in general, although we scholars have found that NGOs can help frame issues and get them on the agenda. The way that policy making itself happens is an autocratic driven process. So there's two models. One is the manual control when Putin decides that he wants something and he goes and gets it like constitutional reform. But most politics happens when executive and judicial agencies float ideas with Putin and then Putin kind of weighs in and then signals his view and then um, reform happens. And within that legislators are either nodding but sometimes needling the regime. So nodding to agree, needling it to push it a little bit further. So let me start with the first case, which starts, uh, which is an attempt to have domestic comprehensive reform, sorry, comprehensive reform on domestic violence in 2013. So a structural opportunity presented itself. Um, according to feminist theory, having more women in politics might matter. So there were more women in the federal assembly than ever before. There was increased international pressure from CEDAW, the UN, as well as European pressure from the Istanbul Convention. And activists told me that Putin had signaled behind closed doors that he was in support of, of going forward with some kind of policy change. And you can see that evidenced in the fact that the, pu the public chamber was charged with um, starting, uh, with, with coming up with uh, some kind of reform. At the same time, there was a beginning of some kind of anti-gender resistance. It wasn't organized yet, but you could see it coming out in the seams. For example, a roundtable participant said that the process of upbringing is violence and that slapping a kid below the bat should not be seen as domestic violence. And more broadly in the regime, there was a traditionalist turn signaled or evidenced by the gay propaganda law. And then of course the invasion of Crimea and then Eastern Ukraine. 
So at this point, Putin goes on record and signals with, with a kind of ambivalence. He says, this is a very sensitive issue. It's very important that the law does not allow state structures to interfere in lives of the family. And that language is the anti-gender language of non-interference in the family. And as a result, the process stalls and um, the legislation is not even officially introduced, although it does get briefly introduced a couple of years later. The second case that I want to talk about is the one progressive reform on domestic violence that happened that Mariana mentioned, the criminalization of domestic violence. Um, feminists, uh, when the law didn't get on the agenda, they increased their pressure, they started using online petitions, they found new allies, for example, in the Human Rights Council, they began using social media in new ways, there was a campaign, I'm not afraid to speak out, which they joined with Ukrainian activists. But the, the main thing that, that, that created the possibility for change was a structural opportunity of judicial reform. The Supreme Court wanted to kind of sort out some problems that it saw within the criminal code. The courts were overloaded. The police were tired of not getting their statistics, which is the main system that regulates their promotion. And the Supreme Court wanted to focus on crimes that didn't result in prison sentences for the most part. So what they decided to do was to move several provisions of the criminal code to the administrative code, and they included the first part of Article 116, which is simple battery. Um, activists rallied, wrote briefs, collected signatures, enlisted their human rights officials, allies, um, and Putin came out with an ambiguous but somewhat supportive signal when he said that some experts believe that decriminalization would be a problem for domestic violence, and, and, and so in that language, he was signaling some support. And some male legislators, including United Russia's Krasnikov, um, nodded to the amended legislation. And, and in a surprising move, because legislation is not often changed in the second reading, the legislation was, in, was changed to respond to the feminist concerns. And so what you had is the criminalization, and I recognize Mariana's point that it's, it's a little more complicated, but bear with me, the criminalization of domestic violence um, in the sense that this notion of close people was added to simple battery. And also it was made into a public private prosecution and not just a private prosecution. So it gave the state a responsibility for actually um, prosecuting the crime for the first time. This reform was very short lived. Um, and so the third case that I'm gonna explore is the decriminalization of domestic violence, um, which happens in 2016 to 2017. The resistance to domestic violence, um, it, it comes in the back, in the, in the backdrop to that resistance is a transnational anti-gender counter movement, it, which it's a counter movement in the sense that it tries to refute claims about gender and LGBTQ rights. And what we have found, feminist scholars have found is that counter movements are advantaged vis-a-vis -vis feminist ones, because, especially in non-democratic regimes. Um, and, uh, the policies against domestic violence were not originally a focus of these movements, but they became politicized, especially as the Istanbul Convention from the Council of Europe on Domestic Violence came into um, signing and ratification. So if you just look quickly at this chart, you'll see that the countries that have ratified um, are Western European ones. The ones that have signed but not ratified are sort of Central and Eastern Europe, and then the countries like Russia that have not even signed um, are post-Soviet states for the most part. So the resistance in Russia becomes congealed into this counter movement. You have top officials of the Russian Orthodox Church who adopt um, a formal resolution that efforts to prevent domestic violence are based on false ideologies. The a, a parents group, the All Parents Russian Resistance organized protests and petitions. Um, and the politics plays out in this way. The structural opportunity was the 2016 elections, the first since major protests in 2011, and the regime needed to mobilize enough folks to vote so that it looked like they were legitimate, and they turned toward conservative pop populism. The conservative politicians like Senator Mazzulina start to needle the regime saying, you have to, to go backwards on this reform. Um, Putin flip-flops and he says, unceremonious interference in, the, in family matters is unacceptable. And Anna, the most prominent women's crisis center in Moscow is put on the foreign agent list. Feminists organize, including Pussy Riot, but it's once Putin has sort of weighed in, it's really impossible almost to make a change at this point. The Russian parliament votes almost unanimously to decriminalize domestic violence and Putin signs off days later. And the, the reform, the one feminist reform lasts less than six months. 
And so here's how it's a decriminalization. Simple battery by close persons, um, as long as it's the first instance, is moved to the administrative code as originally planned. The penalty is changed and there's a return to private prosecution. So the lessons that I draw from this, um, I, you put as a political scientist, a comparative political scientist, I put the variables that we think are important into a chart to kind of analyze which influenced the progressive reform and which created opportunities for the regressive reform. And this is really complicated, but I just kind of wanted to show it to you. I'm gonna simplify it and pull out what I think are important insights. One, reform on domestic violence requires a structural opportunity. It can piggyback on broader reforms or elections. Two, institutions and elites within the state have different interests. So that tactical um, allies can sometimes be found. Um, and, and I think you have to find tactical allies and not just those committed to feminist reform. Three, the informal institutions and processes are key. That Putin's signals and elites readings of those signals are incredibly important. And fourth, that there is now a unified counter movement to domestic violence reform. So, to kind of tie this together and, and bring into a conversation about what's going on right now, I wanna talk about what I call case number four, which is um, after the decriminalization of domestic violence, there's a lot of attention paid to some pretty prominent um, incidents of, of domestic violence, including this case um, and including for Human Rights Watch. There's the biggest protests, feminist protests ever, I think, in terms of, uh, around the Kachatorian case, which are three sisters who, after years of abuse, kill their father, but are being prosecuted by the state for that crime. Um, there is a, an a, a important campaign, um, a I Do Not Want to Die online campaign put forward by activists. And then the, the, the committee, the CEDAW committee from the UN um, condemns Russia's approach to domestic violence, as does the European Court of Human Rights. So all these pressures force, or I don't know, compel the Russian state to begin a new legislative process in the fall of 2019. There are three consultative, consultative bodies related to the legislature, two thirds of which included feminists, including Alona Popova, and they produced a fairly progressive draft, um, but the ultra conservatives protested. Mariana already laid out how the legislation was weakened. Um, it was posted online, there was a lot of discussion. The elites um, around Putin gave out mixed signals, but in December, although Putin said he hadn't read the, the, the draft, he seemed to, seemed to signal that there was a, a, a need to go forward with some kind of legislation. And then all of politics have shifted with the pandemic. There was global attention to the issue of violence against women because lockdown was premised on the idea that the family home was safe, which of course we act we who think about domestic violence know that it is not always safe. Not only that, we don't always have homes. Um, and a new political battle erupted in the media. Feminists offered concern and practical advice, but the ultra conservatives or the traditionalists tried to discredit concerns. Um, they alleged that there was a quote, a feminist lobby. There were personal attacks against Duma Debbie Pushkina, the feminist ally who's been most helpful in pursuing domestic violence legislation. The constitutional reform that included codifying marriage as only between a man and a woman, and also a faith in God as a core Russian value, value was a fig leaf to the ultra conservatives. So what we know now is there's widespread dissatisfaction from both sides about the state's policy towards the family, but there's no consensus on what should, what should happen. Um, there's increased feminist protests and attention, including from Pussy Riot. Um, the regime is continuing to send out mixed signals. I mean, now at this point, maybe more negative than positive. Um, there's pressure on human rights activists in, from human, um, United Russia, as well as from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And just to kind of, I, I'll be curious, maybe this conversation will go this way, is, is you know, I was thinking um, about whether the Duma elections, which are scheduled for a year from now, were a potential structural opportunity. So I just want to leave this with a possibility. It's not a democratic election. There is not a party that's pro-feminist issues that looks likely to get enough votes to be in contestation, but it's a question of what United Russia has to do. It doesn't have a lot of support and it's got to figure out how to get support. And if the population in Russia can be seen as wanting some kind of domestic violence reform, then we could, then maybe United Russia could be pressured to promote progressive reform on domestic violence. Thank you. 
Janet, thank you so much. And uh, we uh, are about to hear from Alona Popova uh, about the uh, social response to this legislation. Uh, and before I introduce her, um, I would like to remind you once again that if you have questions for our guests, please submit them via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, or on our Facebook page. Alona Popova is a social activist and the co-founder of the You Are Not Alone project. She's an advocate for women's rights. She's a social media influencer. She's best known for her I Did Not Want to Die digital campaign against domestic violence. Alona is also one of the co-authors of the first anti-domestic violence law in Russia. She is currently coordinating efforts to pass this bill. She has prepared several other bills to protect women's rights. Uh, she um, she uh, and also she will be, I'm also del delighted to say that she will be joining the Canon Institute next year as a Galina Starovoitova Fellow on Human Rights and Conflict Resolution. Alona, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Sorry for my poor English. And thanks a lot, Mariana and Janet, for brilliant, brilliant presentations. So first, I would like to uh, present my own story, my personal story. Um, in 2014, I ran for office in our Moscow State Duma as an independent candidate. And during one night, my friend, I knew her from our childhood, she called me and she said, can you come please? Uh, she lived outside Moscow in small region of Russia. Uh, when I came, I saw like black body with a lot of hematomas and uh, she was pregnant. Um, so, uh, can you see me? That's something wrong with my cell phone. We can see, now yeah. we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Something wrong with my cell phone, so, so sorry. So her body was, you know, like, she had a lot of hematoma scratches and she was beaten by her boyfriend, like civil husband, how we called it in Russia, and she was pregnant. It was like the last decade of her pregnancy. So she lost her baby. And when I saw this, I don't know what was, what word should I use to call this exact man, but when I saw this man, he said, you can't punish me because we don't have any law in Russia with the help of which you can punish me. And he was right. I was in shock, but he was right. After that, I uh, came again to, my, to the bed with my uh, friend and I asked her, um, please, can you just tell the police officer that this exact man has beaten you. And after that, I promise you that I can be your bodyguard. I can do anything to protect you. Please trust me. And she said, no, this is all my fault. Uh, please don't touch him and so on and so forth. So I was in shock again. After that, I back to Moscow and I organized with the help of my brilliant team, uh, the round table in which I, um, um, I saw a lot of experts like Marie Davtian, the lawyer and the co-author of our law against domestic violence, Alexei Parshin, um, the lawyer of um, Sisters Hachiturian now and the co-author of our law, Marina Pislakova Parker, we called her the mother of our law and many, many great experts. And I asked them, look guys, I am post-graduated from Moscow State University, not as a lawyer, but as a journalist. And as a journalist and social activist, I just ask you, what's wrong with our laws? What can I do to protect victims of domestic violence like my friend? Once again, something wrong with my cell phone. Okay, um, they asked that, look, Alona, first of all, you should post-graduate it um, as a lawyer or as a jurist, and after that, you can fight for the law. So now I'm post-graduated as a lawyer, um, just with one aim, because I would like to uh, protect the victims of domestic violence, and I, I am fighting for the passing of that law to adopt 
uh, the standard law on law against domestic violence. So we have such kind of uh, file uh, in which it's set, this is an equal mark, like everybody is equal, and in which it's set that domestic violence is a crime, but not a tradition. So we use such kind of slogan to promote the idea that it's the domestic violence, it's not our traditional value. And now as a jurist, social activist, and the friend of my friend, I am promoting the idea that we need to pass this law for a hundred percent to protect the victims of domestic violence in Russia, just because we don't have any measures to prevent domestic violence before the criminal articles we need to use. Yeah. I don't know, it's okay, because oh, we can sorry, hear you. It's just, it's okay, don't worry about it. Just ah, keep talking okay. and I think it comes back right after a little bit. The, yeah, the, okay, okay. Yeah, just keep talking. Okay, okay. So um, when we start our campaign against domestic violence, it wasn't, um, so there wasn't a huge amount of people who support us. Uh, when I came first to our um, uh, like very well uh, very well known show in Russia called uh, like on air uh, with Andrei Malakhov, everybody asked me uh, what's wrong with the domestic violence because why they're not going out? I mean, the victims of domestic violence are not going out from their oppressors. Um, this is all their fault and why I'm fighting for the law because we have all the articles in our criminal court or in our civil court or in our family court to protect the victims of domestic violence. So it wasn't huge support. Uh, many, many people were uh, stand up uh, in the audience and they had their really strict arguments that this is all family values. You can't intervene into our families. Um, you can't act like foreign spy or foreign agent because of course, this is not the Russian ideas. This idea is to protect victims of domestic violence. Of course, all the ideas from uh, the Western part of our uh, earth as a planet. So, um, Five years passed from that time, and I was like five days ago in the same show, in the same channel, and everybody in the audience were the supporters of our law. And this is the conclusion that we are fighting not just for the law, but for the culture and for the thoughts of our audience that uh, domestic violence is exactly the crime but not the tradition um, in ultra orthodox representatives of our um, society this is not a huge part i think this is not the vast majority but the small part of our society um, we uh, myself Marie Davtian, Marina Pisklakov Parker, or Oksana Pushkina, we called like foreign spies or Hitler uh, fellows. They called us Hitler fellows uh, and they promoted the idea that we are, uh, as Hitler, uh, would like to kill all the men and to fight with the men uh, and to put all the men into the prison just because we presume that the men. Um, all the men are evil. So um, that campaign uh, against the law um, of domestic violence uh, were invested by uh, or were like financed um, by um, a very prominent Russian oligarch. Uh, his name is uh, Konstantin Malafeev. And he put, I think that he put a lot of money to that campaign to discreditate uh, the law against domestic violence with only one idea. Um, he said, look, um, we are as a Russian empire has our traditional values in which it said that the man is the head of our families. So if these crazy feminists and international spies and agents 
uh, intervent into our families, they destroy the fundamental ideas of uh, our country and of our state. So the main idea of our state is that we are um, the man state, the state for the man. We are the patriarchal state. And of course, the law against domestic violence presume um, that if you are the man and you are the oppressor, of course, we would like to punish you with the help of the law. So um, the, the second idea of their campaign for, to discreditate uh, the law against domestic violence were, can you hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you okay, well. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, perfect. Um, were that, um, we would like to take off all the kids from the families. Um, and after that, when we uh, like distract, they use this term, distract uh, all the kids from the families, um, we um, um, will transfer these kids uh, to the homosexual families or um, uh, to the surgeon to cut the bodies of, this, of these kids um to organs so that idea was one of the brilliant uh propaganda idea to destroy um how they call it the first run of our law in uh, our um, chambers of our parliament and two chambers of our parliament uh, because all the families and especially the mothers from these families um they were um, afraid of uh, intervention intervention into their families and they were afraid of um, like uh, they were afraid if we just take off all the kids from the families with no any reason and now why the law is not so popular among families and why we still don't have any law um, of protection of domestic violence victims um, is just because of that uh, propaganda idea um, that we would like to destroy, not just to destroy the families, but to take off all the kids from the families. And I think that the huge support, uh, su support um, for the anti-campaign against our law um, now, uh, the main audience who supports that idea, of course, uh, uh, is the family audience. So we have a lot of debates, uh, TV debates, radio debates, and uh, internet debates with the re representatives of uh, the families. And of course, in 100% cases, we won with our argument that no, we would, we don't want to take off all the kids from your families. We would like to protect you, your kids, and your husband if your husband, for example, is not uh, oppressor or aggressor or um, uh, the domestic violence boxer, as we called it, as we called him. So uh, we would like to have the prevention measures. And if you think that you have the psychological oppression from your husband or from your partner, for example, we can, um, we can organize the helpline for your partner and to start uh, work with your partner as an aggressor to um, uh, prevent his physical aggression in the future. And as I told you before, in 100% cases we won, when we have face-to-face uh, -face debates with the family uh, representatives. Uh, but for sure, we don't have enough channels to promote our great, brilliant ideas, I think, because we have the brilliant ideas that domestic violence is a crime. Look, it's really the brilliant idea in our patriarchal culture. Um, but we don't have enough uh, responsibility to participate in TV shows or in radio uh, shows. Uh, we can't organize any... Um, huge debates with our opponents and with opponents uh, uh, for our law, just because we don't have enough resources. Or if we collect any resources from abroad, we can be marked as an international agent or international spy. And it will be just um, 
really bad for the campaign uh, for our law. Um, so in this bad situation, um, I think that our society run faster than our state, and of course, run faster than our uh, runs faster than our government, just because we have a lot of supporters uh, among young audience, like 15 plus. Um, that um, young generation uh, helped us to organize. Uh, I don't want to die campaign um, because the story of this campaign is really funny. Um, when uh, it was known that um, our general prosecution or not our investigation committee uh, declared that uh, three sisters Hachiturian, the victims of domestic violence, are not the victims of domestic violence, but the killers, because as our investigative committee mentioned, these three sisters killed their father. They used this word killed. Not that they um, just would like to save their lives, but they killed because they want to kill, as mentioned our investigation committee. So I wrote um, my uh, special post in uh, my at my Facebook page that it's wrong and the argumentation of our investigation committee is wrong and our state acts wrong. Um, uh, our state needs to protect the victims of domestic violence, especially in the case of three sisters Hachiturian, but our government and our states and all our um, um, we call it Silaviki police representatives or investigation committee or uh, general prosecution uh, prosecutor office. They declared that it's it was murder. So I wrote this post and um, young and very well known blogger. Her name is Alexandra Mitroshina. Sent me the message that look, Alona, I am 25, so I am 37. So she's uh, 25 and she wrote me, I think you didn't understand how to use Instagram activity to promote the idea of nonviolence for young generation and I can help you with that. And I asked, um, oh look, it's perfect, uh, but I don't think that we can use Instagram in which we promote like um, beautiful girls or very happy mothers or cooking courses. We can't use the especially social media to promote domestic violence. And I'm sure because for five years I tried, but all my, um, all my posts uh, collected only a few likes. So, and I said, Alexandra, I'm so happy to meet you, but you're one. Uh, and she, she smiled and she said that, okay, I can do by myself, everything just come and um, I can show you how we can win. And she was right. In a month after our um, uh, digital campaign, I don't want to die. I was in our um, uh, state Duma. And there were the round table with uh, MPs and the state representatives. And we were discussing one article in our law. And in many, many cases before that meeting, it was a situation um, in which I was discussing with them and I was understand, I understand, I understood that everything was wrong because they were arguing like, no, 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 um, we can't vote for that special article just because we need to protect our family values, Alona. So we need to stop in this special case and please don't promote this law again. And I thought that in, in this meeting, um, we would repeat uh, this typical situation. But in 10 minutes, uh, the situation rapidly changed. Uh, one MP, he he's a man, he's from Russian region. He said, Alona, look, I understood that you were right because my, uh, my uh, daughter and my grandson, um, they came to me and asked me, what are you doing here? Why are you sitting in our parliament if you can't protect the victims of domestic violence? And he said, so look, I 
understood that I need to protect the law and I need to promote the law among MPs in our state Duma. And I am um, your partner in this special case. I was really in shock and I was really happy because of that. Um, and I was happy because I understood that our young generation can crush all the walls, um, like opposite walls, uh, which we have to pass and to adopt this special law. And this is my final, <laughs> final thought. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it sounds like uh, uh, the the kind of the public education campaign that arose spontaneously over the internet actually had an impact. And I would like to say, I don't think you mentioned that you you put out a petition for the adoption. Oh, now we can see you. Uh, you put out a petition uh, for the adoption of the of the law, and it has uh, close to a million. Uh, supporters now, 916,000 to be exact. So I think that that's, that's a fantastic result. It's just so because we, the young generation, you know, it's not because our generation, it's just the people 18 plus. And yeah. that's why I strongly believe that we will win for a hundred percent. Well, I actually want to ask, and maybe this is, I don't know if it's a, a question just for you, but maybe for everybody. I think uh, as I was getting ready for this discussion, I saw some really interesting numbers from the Levada Center, which seem to suggest, um, I think one of the numbers is that 79% of Russians believe that Russia needs a law that guarantees protection from domestic violence for women. So I thought that that was a very striking number. Uh, it's, it seems to indicate that most Russians acknowledge that there is such a problem and that it really... Uh, is needed. Is that, uh, uh, am I interpreting it correctly, th this this number? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, Janet, sure. Please. We're all familiar with that. So, okay. What do you, Janet, I see you um, unmuting yourself. What do you think? Well, just to say that there's been a lot of survey data on this and it tends to vary, right? Like, so there was support for the decriminalization too in the way that the questions were asked because as, as Alona told us, right, that story about like, the law somehow taking children from their parents was very persuasive. So public opinion has definitely shifted, I think. I think there is evidence, but I would also argue that in an authoritarian regime like Russia, public opinion is not as, doesn't work in the same kind of way. I mean, not public opinion never directly corresponds to, to policy reform. But in Russia, the, more, the question is, you know, what constituents does Putin have to attend to maintain power is the real issue, right? So, you know, to the degree to which this minority that supports this ultra conservative traditionalist anti-gender efforts, um, to the degree to which he needs them is sort of the question. Um, but I think the fact that there is a younger generation that does um, have a different view does suggest when the regime tries to get um, legitimating elections in a year that maybe there's a way for this to happen, but it, it's just a lot more complicated than simply public opinion has come around to this. I think public opinion was actually in support of a law a decade ago as well, or at least more public response or policy response. Um, but it, it, you know, it's just complicated in Russia as everything is. Mariana, um, did you want to add? I, yeah, um, I tend to agree with Janet on a sense that public opinion in Russia works um, in mysterious ways in a way that how it's organized. And sometimes you can get a genuine, actually, sort of opinion of people, but sometimes um, it is organized in a way, as Janet put it, you need to um, understand what part of the population Putin needs more than he needs the other part of the population. But actually with domestic violence law, I've been, we've all been monitoring the, the situation. Um, I was surprised that Levada published that. At the same time, I wasn't surprised because the support for the law in theory and understanding of the problem is actually there, despite what Alona is saying, being very grim about her generation. I'm 10 years older, I'm okay with my generation. You know, it's a lot of people like me who um, obviously understand what the problem is, but uh, the way the state structures the problem, as I said, um, and this is not a particular unique Russian way of thinking about domestic violence as a private issue, right? Everybody has gone through that, and that's fe why feminists are there, right? The feminists have been having a campaign of trying to take domestic violence out of a private 
into the public to actually show that domestic violence has a public impact. And they've used a variety of arguments and one of the, a lot of those arguments have been problematic, I would like to remind you. So the arguments that um, for an employer, for example, to have a happy employee, right? You need to uh, be able to provide um, a, a non-violent working environment that includes uh, taking care of the um, uh, well-being of, of your employee. And basically for women, this is um, a taken care of her being protected against domestic violence, right? So, I mean, th there've been arguments like that. I mean, thinking about taxes, thinking about policies, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think in the present day, and I'm sorry to, to, to put it this way, I mean, the, the, the COVID situation has done a lot of good in a sense that the problem of domestic violence, this issue, has become immediately evident in the pandemic when everybody got locked in a home. And so uh, the governments basically what they did, that they, they, they put women with their abusers in the same home and so became um, 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 sort of uh, the participants in this. But at the same time, Mm, so for a lot of Russians who actually got locked down, you know, they, they, they basically, you know, got the idea what it is, how difficult it is to, to, to be in this situation. Even those who were probably not paying attention or not very uh, particular on that, now they can relate. They can relate that even strongest of families, um, if they're locked together for, you know, whatever, how many months, because they have to work from home, they're not going to, they're not not going to be all happy, they're not going to be all, um, um, you know, relating to each other, including kids, etc. Now they understand that that might go way beyond. And for, for the Russian Federation, considering how many news we have, and, you know, the very weird news from regions, um, but in Volga, you know, no, not Volga, Volgograd region, now the, the woman who is a local deputy said, well, basically, men got really cranky during the, uh, during the quarantine, so that's why we need to deal with domestic violence. That was her explanation i mean she is not your feminist or something but that's interesting how she put it you know because men are cranky now we have an issue and so that that's your uh, way of putting domestic violence out of private into the public because now what the state did they are uh, sort of um publicized or privatized you know that works both ways they basically inquisitioned our homes as public space and that is good for us and that's good for a learning campaign and that's good for, for, for the campaign in general. And I think we are looking at, at the level of awareness that is much higher than it used to be last year when people could just, eh, yeah, it's important, but it's not, and well, you know, they'll manage, you know, there's some activists who manage right now, that's an issue. Thank you very much. And so I'm starting to look at the questions that are coming from the audience. There are actually quite a few. So I'm going to merge a couple of questions together. So. Um, I think in our conversation, so we are primarily talking about gender-based domestic violence within a family. So what does this legislation also have to do? And if not, then how do we, how does Russia deal with, for example, gender-based violence that's not within specifically a legal structure of the family, if a couple is not married, for example, or something that we uh, refer to as date rape, right? How is, is that part of the discussion? Also, what about uh, questions of violence against children that's not necessarily, that's not gender-based, but just violence against children? Is that part of the conversation? Who would like to start? Alona, please. And just unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. So in our law, it said that divorced pair or divorced couple or uh, not legal structurized uh, relations between couple are protected by our law. It means that if you are not registered your official relations, um, you are protected by the law if you have your spouse or your partner and if you have a domestic violence offense. Um, if we, we are talking about kids, so kids are protected by our criminal court and our family court, and especially in our law, um, we never use the term like kids uh, or man or woman because we use like victim and oppressor. So um, of course, 
um, the vast majority of um, families um, are afraid of uh, violence against kids because this is our traditional value. They um, ask us, um, I can beat my kids because this is my parent authority. And my parent authority means that if my uh, kid uh, doesn't understand anything with the help of my mouth or words, I can beat him or her. No, now it's not impossible too, because now we can use in that special cases and art three articles, two in our criminal court and one in our family court to protect our kids. And of course, this is a huge discussion, um, like uh, in our opponent side uh, against our law, that this special law are for women and for kids. No, this special law are for everybody who need to be protected um, because of domestic violence offenses. Right. Um, Ariana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, just um, um, what's, what's interesting about the latest campaigns, and I've been in a field for 25 years now, and so Janet also could add to that, that for those of us who've, who've been in the field for a long time and as ex-lawyer, I don't practice anymore, but um, I could choose to. Um, it's interesting for me to see how um, the latest campaigns are gender-based, the, the, the campaigns against gender-based violence rather than domestic violence per se. Um, there's been a lot of uh, debates around violence against women in a sense that domestic violence is just one of the um, aspects of this. And um, as in, um, in, in, in a draft law that Alona now has been presenting and in an official version of that law, as well as in a previous attempt. Um, again, Russian leg uh, the technical sort of the, the legislative technique works the way that you can't really name people in a gender specific way. So in a sense that the way we uh, write the law or we provide for the legislative process, that's always been the victim and, or I actually I hate the word victim, but it's gonna be the victim. This is the victim and, uh, and the perpetrator in that, in that sense. And the way it reads is what I call false gender neutrality. It's actual gender blindness. But in a way, again, it's speaking about tradition, in a traditional way, how that develops from the Soviet heritage, that's going to be that way. It's good and bad. It's good that it covers uh, pretty much everyone. It's bad that the first people I'm pretty sure to use that law are gonna be men who got abused by their spouses or something like that, because that's how it works. You know, That's how it works with the other gender specific or gender sensitive legislation when you don't have a specificity of, of that construct to be a woman. That was, that's one thing. And the other thing is that as a lot of campaigns and a special awareness of the people uh, speaking about rape or speaking about sexual harassment these days. So these are parts of this whole understanding that women in the Russian society are basically discriminated against and uh, um, oppressed, as uh, Alona mentioned, is a patriarchal state. And the concept of patriarchy is that, which for me, I think it's a huge achievement uh, in, uh, in sort of in the awareness, on the awareness front, because um, speaking about patriarchy is difficult and being a professor, of course, and, and teaching general law course in, in a variety of Russian universities, the first thing you, you talk to students about is about theory and theoretically when you talk about patriarchy now uh, students will no no we were okay i mean because you used to say no we there's equality nobody is discriminated against and then and, and women would say no no we, we're perfectly fine i mean look we are here at the university but then the way you sort of talk about it uh it, it, sometimes it's very difficult to actually explain that in the past couple of years when i worked in a higher school of economics and i, I talked to students they immediately get it so there is no debate you know whether we are discriminated against or not that that's not an issue anymore so i again for me it's it's a huge um it's a huge achievement on behalf of the activists on behalf of the campaigns thanks to digital platforms again you know so i don't know if we'd achieve uh, achieve uh, that level of awareness that quickly if we didn't have social networks i mean we have to be i mean we all hate social networks but we have to be grateful to them in a sense that how information is uh, promoted and distributed and um, a specific thing about date rape actually it's interesting though that although I mean, that, that, again legislation doesn't do date rape due to the legislation being very generic so it's article 131 rape anyway but it's interesting to look at the, at the, at the legal practice 
um, Russian, Russian legislation are constructed exactly the same way as American does or anybody else has done before. I mean, think about Russian legislation as this traditional uh, nation state before feminist reform legislation. I'm pretty sure that everybody remembers that. I mean, we're old enough to remember that. So that, that's how they do that. So technically you can prosecute, but the notion of consent is problematic. Although the court is very good at the notion of consent and how the notion of consent is basically constructed. They have um, a list of, of cases, but we're still on in a shadow, on a gray shadow thing. She didn't say no, then it's a yes, right? So we don't have the uh, the achievements like in a Swedish criminal code, for example, or, or in other countries' criminal codes that there should be an affirmative consent. There is no affirmative consent thing. And that obviously in the prosecution of date rape is problematic. And um, again, uh, there's been a lot of media coverage um, exactly about it, exactly about date rape and how it's difficult to achieve, uh, to, to actually prove consent, right? And whatever she says, nobody of course gives a, um, um, any a sort of um, um, uh, attention to that because I mean, it's, she said, he said, they were all drunk or they were, you know, in whatever situation. So we're not there yet, but um, as I usually keep telling people, if you think about Russian legislation, it's like you are still in this gray zone, like after the 19th century, but before feminist reform, you know, we are there. Well, and what about, and this is something that one of our viewers uh, is asking, Dr. Laura, Lori Krieger points out that the femicide rate in Russia is uh, quite high. Is that a separate category or is this part of, uh, of this law as well? Who would like to? Uh, femicide is not a separate category. So it's just a cr criminological assessment. So we don't have a femicide as a category. So it's article 105, you know, so you basically in the general article, it's a murder. Uh, well, but Russian language doesn't have murder, manslaughter. We have premeditated, unpremeditated homicides, you know, so that's uh, the thing. Um, so there is no specific um, category in uh, killing just women. Um, there are still old, what I call old traditional articles of the criminal code when you have uh, um, a, um, an abortion or, or killing a baby, right, as a result of, um, of beatings. You know, the Alonis case should have been prosecuted under criminal law because that's a clear case if she lost as a result of a beating that's a criminal offense and infanticide is still sort of a part of the code but femicide is not a separate again a separate a category however there is a huge amount of research on that so you know in Russia so if you go into actually looking at that there's, there's quite a good amount of research on that and the numbers I wouldn't say that they are higher than in other countries they are um, not that high as in uh, for example Italy, Italy obviously is the leading if we look again at, uh, at the numbers, but now this is not a category, again, due to what we've, uh, due to the way Russians legislate in terms of technique of, of Okay, thank you very much, Mariana. Um, if nobody wants to add anything, I'll, I'll ask uh, the next question uh, that also has come from the audience. And the question is, okay, so it's clear we understand that the Russian Orthodox Church represents the opposition to this legislation. What about other religious groups in Russia? Uh, how do they, do, do they have uh, kind of specified clear positions on this issue? Could maybe some of them be uh, partners, allies in this, uh, in this? Alona, please. Um, we were pretty sure that um, some churches or uh, religious representat rep representatives, they need to be for the law. But when this huge campaign against our law started, uh, the representative of Muslim um, community here in Russia and in Moscow, the representative of uh, Jewish community here in Moscow, the representative of Russian Orthodox Church organized a special round table in which they signed um, Alona, you just you, you got muted. We, we don't hear you anymore. Um, you, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. I think we, the last thing we heard is that you were speaking to representatives of the Jewish community. Yeah, so Oh, you're muted again. There's something wrong. Alona, you okay? I'm mute. Yeah, I'm okay. I have a lot of 
problems with my cell phone just because I'm under the prosecution uh, because of our MP in our state Duma because I use like uh, 16 million the, the amount of our uh, like statistics of our uh, victims of domestic violence in Russia like 16 million and after that one of MP asked our investigation committee to start the prosecution against me and something wrong and, and my cell phone is broken now something wrong started with my uh, cell phone so I don't know what's going on with that so but uh, my answer was that all the representatives different religious and uh, like religion groups uh, most uh, mostly orthodox one or um, uh, ultra conservative one, they signed the special declaration against our law um, with the reason and with the resume that um, they didn't want that law because th this law is against uh, families like Muslim families, uh, orthodox families and Jewish families, all the families. And this declaration was discussed in our main church in Russia um don't want how will it be in english uh yeah, like the the headquarter of our russian orthodox church and uh, all these groups uh, has a huge debate uh how they need to fight uh with our law uh one year ago so no we don't have any huge support from russian orthodox church but i know some um uh, some people from Russian Orthodox Church, some people from Muslim community, very well known people who agitated for the law and who agitates for the law um, because they strongly believe that we need to protect the victims of domestic violence. And one day ago, I wrote um, the special article about the, um, uh, the shelters uh, which were organized by, with the help of Russian Orthodox Church. For example, our um, huge friend, uh, the shelter named Kitish, uh, was organized with the help and with the money from Russian Orthodox, uh, Orthodox community and Russian Orthodox Church. So we see how um, divided is our community and our society, like 50-50, I think like 50% uh, of representatives of religion groups are for the law and 50% uh, is against. Okay, thank you very much, Janet, please. I just wanna kind of reaffirm what I think Alona is saying in the sense that, you know, I think it's really important to differentiate between the hierarchies of the Russian Orthodox Church and what's actually going on on the ground, that there are, um, there are, Russian Orthodox supported shelters and services that have been helping victims of domestic violence. Um, there are other groups that are Jewish, Muslim, et cetera, that have been helping victims of domestic violence. And that several of these um, or, uh, groups gathered in, for example, in Moscow in 2018 at interfaith um, conference held at the public chamber that was supported by a presidential grant to discuss the problem of domestic violence, right? So, you know, it's, it, it's really important to kind of differentiate between the, the mouthpiece of the Russian Orthodox Church and some of these other organizations, but also from, from what's actually going on on the ground and the diversity within these communities. Mariana, please. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. So I'll follow the, the, the uh, Alona's and, and Janet's um, um, a sort of uh, thoughts. Um, well, first of all, we, we need to remember that um, in any other context, the churches were not supporting any domestic violence legislation. So if you go into any other context, the churches, that's not the church's job to actually support, right, um, uh, legislation, especially feminist legislation on domestic violence. It's always been a situation in which you have the hierarchies and you have the grassroots movements. And in the grassroots movement, you'd have the female religious groups, for example, who'd um, promote and support us or support survivors of domestic violence, right? I mean, we've been through that. So um, in a sense, um, that it's speaking about global experiences that's that's very relevant to russia now you know that's exactly what's happening so you're not expecting the hierarchies the official um uh, level to support the 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 legislation on domestic violence feminists or not that doesn't matter how 
radical or, or not radical it is. However, if you look at uh, the middle sort of uh, middle ground and then uh, the, 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 the grassroots, it's a lot of priests, for example, parish priests, as well as imams, you know, who do support and who do um, uh, uh, sort of cooperate and who do that because they, they, truly, they, truly, they truly believe and, and, and they try to help. And again, here traditions come, here, here is the tradition coming in. In Russian Orthodox Church, the, the priest was the first on the ground to help his family quarrel. The history shows us, especially, you know, when, before they, they went to court, you know, when in, in, in the court case, uh, the, 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 the civil authorities, the, 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 the secular authorities will be always asking, did you talk to the priest? Yes. And the priest suggested would go to the court to actually uh, seek for divorce or, you know, or to, or to bring charges against the husband. So in a sense, that's what they've been doing. You know, there've been many have been trying to a colleague of mine is doing this research she's she looking at uh, the role of, of parish priests in, in family counseling and um you know what she shares her research is, is fascinating because the majority of family counseling is still about uh, family problems and a lot of them domestic violence and so the priests are actually there and a lot of them are supporting uh, the legislation the other problem is that uh, the way they relate to their bishop is, 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 is an entirely different matter. And then he, he, here the structure coming in and here, so what's, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. So in a way, so it's just a nutshell, the churches are not there for us, right? But, you know, they, the God is there probably for us, you know, that I, I formulate that this way. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, again, just kind of bringing in um, one of our, um, uh, viewers questions um, and just uh, kind of broadening it a little bit. Uh, there's obviously a lot of social activism happening right now in the post-Soviet space in, in Belarus, obviously in Kyrgyzstan. Um, do you, are there opportunities for collaboration at all? Or are these issues so specific and so internal uh, or can you work with other activists in the sphere from other areas? Also uh, from Ukraine, I know that in Ukraine there, there are very active uh, organizations, groups um, in this regard have been for many years. Uh, and, and in fact, um, I remember that uh, finding out with, with some surprise, positive surprise that after 2014, there was still, when, when basically so much collaboration between Russian and Ukrainian groups ended, there was still some collaboration among those advancing and the women's issues, uh, et cetera, between Russia, in, in Russia and in Ukraine. So I'm just curious about that collaboration. We have a like lot of say. connections. Yeah, we have a lot of connections with uh, Ukrainian uh, civil society representatives and uh, like Belarusian for sure. And I have a lot of messages in my Instagram and Facebook uh, from the uh, women who live in Ukraine, in Ukraine or in Belarus, uh, with the cases of domestic violence, and they asked for help. Um, and I transfer or I forward all uh, their messages, all the they mess their messages um, to the representatives of uh, civil society from Ukraine or Belarus. And of course, we are strongly connected because of our patriarchal regime that we have in post-Soviet Union like countries. Um, we have a lot of discussions, how can we cooperate? And for example, um, when in Armenia, um, the standalone law against domestic violence <coughs> was voted, I was in their parliament. And because they invited me to present the situation that we have in Russia and uh, we strongly support each other when they voted for the law against uh, domestic violence in Ukraine, um, we communicated with uh, uh, experts and civil society representatives from Ukraine, just because we feel that we are all together and we are the power. We are not the patriarchal players. We are um, the self-sustained um, like experts, we understand that we need to fight for the womenomics and women politics and women diplomacy. And it's not about the war, it's about our peace and our peaceful society. And we have uh, the common problems in our countries. So we can't think that we are the enemies, we are the friends. Absolutely, anybody else would like to add anything? Janet, please. 
Um, just to say that, you know, the I don't want to say it campaign, for example, was it was begun by Ukrainian activists. Um, now I'm thinking it's 2014, but definitely after the invasion. So like, that's pretty remarkable. I think that there was this kind of collaboration and that the, it, you know, it was based in Ukrainian, but also using the Russian language as communication across the region. Um, but at this, and, and so second, that Russia stands out as being the most backward country, maybe Belarus on domestic violence. I don't actually know that, but Ukraine has passed the first law and then a more recent law on, on domestic violence. So it's really progressive. So there was a lot that Russian activists could, could I mean, learn, I said the activists need to learn, so the state could um, be much more progressive. But at the, in the end, you know, law and policy is still a state specific issue and it is, um, there's a lot of reason to focus on to focus on the Russian government because it is the Russian government that needs to change. Thank you very much. And so let me ask you the last question that uh, we also we had uh, come from Alexander Hilkov, uh, who is asking, and I'm, I'm going to again broaden it a little bit. Uh, what uh, what can the international community do to support progressive change in Russia? Because we know that Russia does have some international obligations under some conventions that it's part of, uh, but maybe more broadly, what can the activists in the West or, or globally do? Uh, what is the role here? Um, can I please answer? Thanks a please. lot to Alexander Hilkov, because with his help, we just uh, had a lot of courses and exchange programs between Russia and the US um, in terms of domestic violence and protection of victims of domestic violence. And you know, I got the great case, uh, one lady from the last group of this exchange programs, which were organized by Alexander Kilkov, uh, she became the lawyer uh, she was just a jurist and she became the lawyer and she is a fighter for the women's rights and for the rights of victims of domestic violence. And she was so impressed by the experience um, that she got from this special trip. Uh, I think that international community and like foreign activists can help us uh, with the sharing of the experience um, like discussing all the common problems and publishing some materials uh, about Russia and uh, the law against domestic violence just because we need huge media support. And I think that with the help of social media and expert support and such kind of exchange programs, we can change a lot in our own country for 100%. Thank you. And Janet, very quickly, I don't know if Mariana, you want to say, but we, we just, we have two minutes left, but uh, is there something you wanted to add, Janet? I think I saw you raising your hand. No? I wasn't. <laughs> I mean, I'm really curious about that too. I've always been worried about like signing uh, Aliona's petitions and whether that's problematic, because I certainly don't want to make things worse. Um, but as, as far as I've heard, you know, I, I don't know. I think bringing as much attention as possible sounds seems good, but there is a question of backlash. Great, thank you. Mariana, said, very, very quickly. Yeah, so from the point of view, from the institutional point of view, international community is quite important because Russia is still part of all the international, inst the international organizations. Um, the only problem is that um, a lot of uh, pressure put on Russia has been done as a uh, pullback and exchange for, for other things, you know, so international community in, institutionally should be actually more genuine in their pressure. And uh, my experience as international officer for the UN, you know, so it's be genuine and that's good. We're gonna be okay. Thank you very much. So uh, I want to thank all of you, our speakers. I want to thank our audience members who sent such great questions. And again, this is the first uh, of a series of events that we're doing in the status of women in Russia and Eurasia. So please stay tuned and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>